I'm sorry to uh, have to interrupt such a convivial evening, but there, uh, there is yet more uh, business to be done. Uh, for those of you who haven't met, my name is Steve Holmes. Uh, I'm the head of School of Divinity here um, in St Andrews, and uh, I, as such, I'd like to add my welcome to you all and my warmest congratulations to Alan and Andrew and the team who have put on this conference, which has been absolutely wonderful so far, and what we know continue to be so tomorrow. We're delighted to see the formal launch uh, with this conference of the Logos Institute in Analytic and Exegetical Theology, and we look forward to it continuing to be a significant and central part of the intellectual life of our school uh, for years to come, sponsoring conversations like this one, intellectually serious and interdisciplinary, and bringing the best of the best in terms of scholarship here to St Andrews. And speaking of the best of the best in terms of scholarship, uh, we have tonight um, an address from Professor Sarah Copley, the Norris Holtz Professor of Divinity in Cambridge. Sarah has previously taught at Lancaster, Oxford and Harvard, where she held what I reliably informed my colleagues on my table, um, is pronounced the Malincroft Chair uh, of Divinity for 12 years. Um, I looked at the list of Sarah's publications. Uh, I have read shorter journal articles. <laughs> but she has made, as you will all know, I'm sure, significant contributions in the areas of patristic theology, uh, philosophy of religion, particularly epistemology, uh, spiritual theology, Trinitarian theology. Many of us would have appreciated the first volume um, of her systematic theology, God's Sexuality and the Self, which came out uh, several years ago now, three, four years ago now, and we'll be eager for the promised three further volumes um, to appear. Um, she's one of the most able and one of the most interesting theologians working in the English language today, I think, and we look forward to what you have to share with us tonight, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. And um, like everybody, I want to say how grateful we all are to Alan Torrance for this wonderful event, um, and particularly in my case for the honour of this invitation to address you in this after-dinner moment. Um, when Alan first asked me to do this slot, I had it in mind to make just one hilarious joke about the hypostatic union. <laughs> Whatever that might be, I was dreaming it up on my bed. And I'll leave it at that so that the drinking could go on. Um, but um, then it became obvious to me that he wanted a bit more. But um, fear not, um, this will be short. In fact, I have taken it as my brief merely to throw down some gauntlets in a way which may generate discussion. I hope not all aimed at me. Um, and get to the heart of what we're about in trying to pull exegetical, systematic, and philosophical work together in relation to the Incarnation. Three points only follow then, but contrapuntally related. The first is historical, the second philosophical, the third and last we could call systematic, albeit in the suitably chastened and philosophical style of analytic theology. But in preparation for these three points, let me provide an introductory reminiscence for the elderly here. <laughs> Those of us over a certain age, which I won't mention, can remember the furore produced by the publication of a book edited by John Hick called The Myth of God Incarnate in 1977. In retrospect, this collection represented, I think, a sort of nadir of a particular kind of British theological <coughs> liberalism, and for me in particular, a liberal too at the time, so I tell the story against myself, it ultimately had a kind of purgative effect as I reflected on the philosophical lessons of it. Now I don't say this from the perspective of either an assumed or righteous orthodoxy, which is always open to question, but what it brought into the stark light of day were two fundamental objections beloved of modern liberals against classical incarnationalists, both of which turned out on closer inspection to be distracting category mistakes. The first was the supposition that whatever the historical critical work of the New Testament scholars could provide, 
it could never work up enough evidence to justify the claims of classic incarnational Christology that Jesus was God. Now, Stephen Evans has already had a good go at this mistakenly parsed problem, and I largely agree with his position. But I'm a tad worried that a ghost of this kind of Lockean evidentialism still hangs around the world of British New Testament scholarship and some systematic reflections on incarnational Christology more generally. Secondly, the myth of God incarnate also rehearsed and exposed the other <coughs> great modernistic objection to incarnationalism, viz. that it is intrinsically and logically incoherent that to put it in the words of John Hick himself, it is approximately equivalent to saying that a square is a circle. This has come to be called the fundamental problem in analytic Christology. Not only does this objection assume, of course, that we know in advance what divinity and humanity can note, but it mistakenly perceives these two sets of characteristics as somehow in competition. More of that anon. Now, we've come a long way since then as New Testament and philosophical scholars, but arguably not far enough, which is perhaps what our project is about. Indeed, my fear is that, despite ourselves, we are still somewhat haunted by these two modernistic ghosts, the historiographical one and the coherence one, as I'll now explain. The immediate popular riposte volume to the myth of God incarnate, entitled The Truth of God Incarnate, frankly contributed more heat than light and presented a jumble of conservative responses which by no means consistently nailed the underlying philosophical problems. Later, in the more stringent philosophical climes of Notre Dame, well was represented here today, Thomas V. Morris produced another riposte, The Logic of God Incarnate of 1986, which was to set the so-called abstract tone for much succeeding analytic philosophy of religion in defense of the doctrine of the incarnation according to a two minds model. Morris Wiles, one of the chief myth of God incarnate contributors and incidentally my doctor father at the time, mm -hmm. reviewing Morris in the Journal of Theological Studies which he edited then, could scarcely bear to give the book even one brief paragraph of comment, and noted with uncharacteristic snideness that Morris's inability to spell Apollinarianism <laughs> throughout the book, which was quite an achievement, was in itself a sign of his disabling literalism and unhistorical abstraction from the rarely pressing issues. And so the battle lines were drawn. Analytic Christology became, at least for the meantime, the scourge of New Testament scholars and systematicians alike. Now, with this seemingly remote, for many of you, yet still somewhat relevant backlog in mind, let me press my three brief, after dinner, bibulous comments for this illustrious gallery. One, historical issues first. Let me put this point boldly even provocatively, and I do expect the ceiling to fall down on me. <laughs> as we come together as exegetes, theologians, and philosophers to learn from each other and think afresh about the problems of incarnationalism, is there sometimes still a danger for the exegetes first in thinking that their work can deliver all the goods, can precisely provide all the evidences that inform and sustain incarnational faith? To be frank, I was frustrated yesterday evening, for instance, particularly in the panel session, at the way our revered exegetical colleagues kept pushing away what they evidently see as abstract or obfuscating philosophical speculations about the nature of God or Christ, as if we could well do without these and simply substitute a New Testament-inspired narrative theology of some sort. I'm bound to ask somewhat mortally, does even Harnack still haunt these hallowed halls in some form? Is there a lurking presumption that either an historical reconstruction of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and teaching, and or an account of the more richly varied early New Testament responses to him, can do the Christological trick 
better than the supposed complications of later Greek philosophical thinking. And this is particularly pressing because many New Testament scholars gathered here, in contrast to the period of the myth of God incarnate debate, fashions come and go, are quite at ease with the idea of an early high Christology in the New Testament, and therefore tend to assume a sort of obviousness of a Nicene as opposed to an Arian outcome to the fourth century debates. And yet that outcome is, it seems to me, by no means obvious, simply by taking exegetical or historical thought. Not only are certain very basic philosophical decisions and choices at stake about the nature of God and how God relates to the world, it surely cannot be that it is a matter of indifference, as it seemed to be last evening, whether God is simple or intemporal, for instance. But there is also the underlying epistemic issue about how we claim to know what we say we know about Jesus, his Father and the Spirit, and indeed how such claims might be appropriately disconfirmed. In other words, though I personally take it as read, as some past analytic philosophers of religion have admittedly not, that there is a duty to reflect most attentively to the deliverances of New Testament scholarship when doing Christology, albeit being aware of the inevitable swings of fashion in this area, I am not at all certain that that compliment is reciprocated. Is there still a presumption, evidentialist in propulsion or not, that New Testament work can in principle supply all the Christological goods and leave the philosophers out of it? This should certainly be a point of contestation amongst us, and I suggest we debate it. Two, philosophical issues, second. <coughs> Here I can afford to be sharper still, since I'm criticizing my own guild. Issues of philosophical coherence obviously grip the concerns of philosophers and analytic theologians more than they do the exegetes. And the concern to fight off the square circle jibe in Christology has rightly animated a good deal of analytic work on incarnationalism from Thomas Morris onwards. But there have been problems, two in particular that I can think of, which are ironically related in their basic propulsion. This basic propulsion lies in the continuing unease in analytic circles about the prima facie logical incompatibility of the lists of characteristics of divinity and the list of characteristics of humanity, and the problem, therefore, of how to conjoin them hypostatically in any account of the incarnation, or whether perhaps to dispense with some of the divine ones in the canonic account. The first variant here has been the tendency to concoct new thought experiments in analytical Christology such as the distinctly uneasy, in my view, divided mind model. And these are unhappily fed by the idea of these two sets of characteristics competing, so to speak, for the same space. This can result in weird statements from such as Richard Swinburne, for instance in his The Christian God, that, quote, the Freudian account of the divided mind helps us to see the logical possibility of an individual, for good reason, with conscious intention, keeping a lesser belief system separate from his main belief system, and simultaneously doing different actions guided by different sets of beliefs of which he is consciously aware. That's quote. Kind of worryingly quasi-Nestorian approach within a kind of Freudian model. Now, what is missing here, in comparison, for instance, with someone as sophisticated and expounding, developed conciliar Christology as Thomas Aquinas, is the whole idea of a wholly transcendent divine entity, the supposit of the Son, uniquely taking on, assuming, humanity in a form which is necessarily different, in one crucial respect at least, from other human persons, because in this instance, the human body and soul are conjoined to a higher entity, the Logos. But in a way that no sense competes logically with that humanity, because it is of a completely different order. Does this way of parsing incarnation involve seemingly discomforting paradoxical thinking of some sort? 
It seems so, and I'll come back to that. And this is doubtless underlyingly what leads unsympathetic exponents such as Richard Cross to insist that really Thomas is just a monophysite in disguise, or else simply confused and inconsistent. But it has tended to be assumed by analytic thinkers that any appeal to paradox must at all costs be avoided. And hence the alternative and second major evasion tactic, that of kenosis, rendered as an actual divestment of all the divine characteristics which are incompatible with the human, at the moment of incarnation. And I remember long debates with Steve Davis during Stephen Evans' project on exploring canonic Christology as to whether Davis had not mistakenly and unconsciously construed John 1.14, the word became flesh, as the word turned into flesh. And I think he had. That's just up the spout. <laughs> Of course, the very ontological mechanics of kenosis, thus understood, have enormous extra metaphysical costs and are in no way how the patristic and scholastic eras read Philippians 2 in the first place. But the assumption is that these difficulties are preferable to the recourse to any acknowledged paradox. So three, systematic conclusions. You will see by now where this brief argument has been leading me. The attempted erasure, or at least easing, of any sense of paradox on the assumption that it is simply a false baptism of incoherence has been a striking feature of analytic philosophy of religion's approach to Christology in recent decades. But this has been on the assumption that what paradox invariably connotes philosophically is a sometimes hidden actual contradiction. But in fact, the primary definition as given in most dictionaries, I checked last night, is the opposite. Quote, a statement that is seemingly contradictory, but is perhaps true, rather than, quote, a self-contradictory statement that at first seems true. In most dictionaries, you get both of these side by side, which is really revealing and interesting. If the first were granted, I would count, for instance, Tim Paul's wonderful recent defense of Thomas's reduplicative strategy in Christology, in his book In Defense of Conciliar Christology, as precisely that, a celebration of paradoxical thinking in the best possible sense, starting from the assumption that we give Thomas the benefit of the doubt that what he's trying to explicate could be coherent, and then parsing how that is so. But I'm not sure that Tim would like to be called a paradoxical thinker. We'll ask him later. <laughs> What's in the name then? At the end of the day, I may not be able to persuade analytic theologians to call, to re-embrace this positive new meaning of paradox with joy and elan. But what I do urge on the discourse at this point is a patient and discerning continuing analysis of the crucial mystery points of the great patristic and scholastic Christologians of tradition, supremely those in East and West who can join all the complexities of the full conciliar tradition, I mean at least up to Nicaea, too. Are these mystery points mere obfuscations, or are they necessary points of analogical stretching from the known to the unique and unknown, seeming so? yet on closer inspection, capable of true defense. Such is, at least up to now, uncomfortable territory for the analytic thinker. But I put it to you, there is nothing wrong with being analytically clear about the limits of one's analytical clarity. I think Thomas Aquinas would have signed on to that. Perhaps then the challenges that emerge from these um, after-dinner over the dicta are twofold and both go back to those intellectual developments of the modern period that might seem to threaten the viability of a classic incarnational approach, such as Thomas's. First, one has to surmount the challenge of modern historical critical approaches to the biblical Jesus, yet at the same time acknowledge that metaphysical discussions of the person of Christ need not and must not be accounted incompatible with these 
but seen as two non-competing and necessarily complementary perspectives on the same reality. If one drives a wedge between them, or tries to choose between them, it is exceedingly difficult to recover any convincing Christology in the Orthodox tradition for today. Secondly, the essentially paradoxical idea, in my positive sense, of a divine son who takes on a fully authentic and vulnerable human nature with characteristics necessarily incompatible with those of divinity has to be confronted and given some rigorously convincing philosophical explication without fear of essential points of mysterious uniqueness and even elements of apophatic nescience. These are not failures in Christological discourse, as great classic exemplars teach us. If one falls at either or both of these two modern fences, historiographical, philosophical, however, I think the classic incarnational game may be up and certain profound negative soteriological implications will inexorably accrue. Thank you.